Welcome back, welcome back. This time to effect sizes and confidence intervals. Imagine the trumpet uh, uh, fanfare. Thank you for joining me with this. So we're moving on from the new statistics why to how. And first, a few words about effect size. I've always thought it's a rather awkward label effect size because it seems to beg a question that there's some cause. But Cohen's definition of an effect size, which I'll follow, is it's just an amount of something we're interested in. So I mean, we could measure the average blood pressure of everyone in the room and that would be a perfectly valid um, effect size. might be very tedious, but it would be okay. No cause need be identified. The other thing about effect sizes is basically there's nothing new. We've all been using them all our lives. And they can be as common and familiar as a mean, a difference between means, a percentage, a frequency, a correlation, absolutely standard sorts of measures. Or, of course, they can be more complex and specialised things, R squared and Cohen's D, a regression slope, all sorts of things, but not a p-value. A p-value is not an effect size. Now, just a little side comment. My strategy in all this is to simplify things and make the usual sort of assumptions of independent random sampling from normally distributed populations. And I'm advocating estimation, the new statistics, fully recognising that there are many other goodies ahead once we're broken free from NHST. For example, Bayesian techniques I think are full of promise and they're sweeping a number of other disciplines in psychology to some extent, robust methods, resampling and so on and so on. And in a way, quantitative models, developing these and selecting them and evaluating them is really what quantitative cumulative science is all about. And our statistics are just steps or tools in order to facilitate uh, model building and testing. Why did I choose estimation? Well, because I think for reform of statistical practices that's going to actually work and happen, we need three things. First, we've got to move on from NHST. It's so clear that it's been damaging and restrictive, despite being seductively appealing and deeply entrenched in our thinking. We need to move on in particular from dichotomous thinking. I mean, how limiting to build theories that just propose this is more than that, rather than to aim to be quantitative, to estimate the size of things. And then point three, are there resources available so that these new things are accessible? And I believe, for example, Bayesian statistics certainly ticks the first two boxes, but I may be wrong, but my feeling is uh, so far, I haven't seen ways that I feel I could explain to beginning students for Bayesian techniques, which I feel I can have a bit of a go with estimation. And so if we want change that will happen, I think estimation's a very good bet, even recognising it just as a first big step and there are lots of other uh, additional things we should investigate as well. So here we have the trumpet fanfare. You can read in the news a statement, public support for Proposition C is 53% in a poll with a 2% margin of error. And probably most people have a fair understanding that, well, 53% is our best bet. The true value will be different. We don't know it. We've just got a poll result. If we did the poll again with a new sample, we get a different result, but probably within this interval. That the true value most likely lies within the span of this interval. These are all quite reasonable intuitions. And so this gives us a, a good basis, I think, for teaching statistics. We start with a, a naturally reasonable sort of proposal and technique rather than the weird backward logic of p-values and significance testing. Now, I like putting this relative likelihood curve on a confidence interval. It seems to me to reveal the inner shape of a confidence interval. Just the bare line like that suggests that something special happens at the end, whereas in fact we've got a whole distribution of possibility. And we can think of this as a curve of plausibility, or the most plausible place for the true value to lie is round about here, and then plausibility drops off 
smoothly goes through the limits. Nothing special happens at either limit. And I actually double that curve, put the mirror on and call it the cat's eye picture. So this is just the likelihood curve. And this seems to me a representation of a confidence interval that reveals the sort of evidence distribution that a confidence interval tells us. Most plausible, if you had to bet where the true value is, your best bets would be round about the middle and the quality of bet would decrease. And out here, well, the true value may be out here, but that would be a far worse bet. I'm calling each arm of the confidence interval the margin of error, MOE. And I'm labeling the uh, center point, typically the mean as our point estimate, and the whole interval as the interval estimate, and calling the ends the lower and upper limit. Oh, now we get playtime. I could do this all day, you know. This is fascinating stuff. I, in fact, many days of my life I have. It's, I find it so interesting. Let's take a sample of size 20. There it is. There it is. Let's take another one. Oh, different. Another one, another one, another one, another one. Sampling variability. Now, as we're doing that, what are we imagining? Well, first, we're imagining that there's some population. And in fact, let me reveal it to you, and I'll fill it up with dots just to illustrate that I'm choosing randomly here from this infinite number of blue dots that are potential measurements. Uh, now, let's. Um, clear and take one and display the mean, and there it is. And typically that's all a researcher knows, just the data and what we calculate from it, and we don't know the population. But I'm in the computer, let me do it again, and drop down the first mean, and again, and again, and take run this, and what do I have? The dance of the means. You can imagine your own doof doof music or whatever your preference is to go with that. Then I can pile these up. And here we have the sampling distribution of the sample mean, the distribution, the empirical distribution of means uh, of a whole lot of successive samples. And we can fit a distribution curve to that, which is a normal distribution. And uh, it fits particularly well. Suppose I go to larger samples. So instead of, well, let's clear all that. Uh, samples of say 80, four times as large, and I do the same thing. I'm going to build up this sampling distribution. It's narrower. Of course it is, because in each of our samples we've got four times as many points. If we look at the dance of the means, it's much narrower and tighter. That's why it's worth the extra time and effort and cost of taking bigger samples because on average the sample means will be closer to the population mean. So I'm now going to go back to 20 as our sample size and uh, get a um, pile of means which I call the mean heap. So there's our dance of the means and there's our mean heap with the curve on it. Let's build that up just for a moment. And then I'm going to think about the, what we're trying to estimate which is the population mean mu. And I'm noticing that most of these means are quite close to mu, which is encouraging. That means that the uh, most sample means are going to give me a pretty good idea of where the population mean is. And that's what we're trying to estimate, the population mean. Let me turn on the tram lines. So this is um, a pair of lines that are positioned so that they, in the long run they'll capture 95% of sample means. Let me turn on standard deviation up here in the population and contrast it with standard error down the bottom. So the standard deviation of the population distribution, here it is, 20. This normal distribution, of course, has a standard deviation and it's given the special name, the standard error. So the standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means. Quite, you knew that, didn't you? You with me? The standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of what I call the mean heap down here. So when somebody at a party says to you standard error, you don't get tight in the stomach. You just say, yeah, I know what that is. It's the standard deviation of this green pile down here. 
So here are our tram lines, and they're positioned 1.96 times standard error away from the population mean mu. And I'm going to give the name MOE, margin of error, for that distance, roughly twice the standard error, because that's the maximum likely estimation error, the maximum likely distance between my sample mean and a population mean. Only the odd guys out here in the upper and lower tails are going to have a bigger estimation error than MOE. So now let's focus on this distance between the tram lines. So it's double MOE, MOE either side of mu. And notice that if uh, most of our sample means are within MOE of mu, then if we just have a sample mean, where's our best bet as to where mu lies? Within MOE of that sample mean. If A is close to B, B is close to A. If sample means are close to mu, then mu is likely to be close to sample means. So what I'm now going to do is turn on a stripe of the distance between the tram lines, and I'm going to apply it to every sample mean. And for all the sample means that fall within the tram lines, this will capture the population value. And I'm going to call this interval a confidence interval. Now let's show capture, and we could even um, uh, turn off the tram lines and run this. And intervals that, do, ah, what a relief, there's one that doesn't capture intervals that don't capture are colored red in ESCII, and these are the sample means that would have been down in the tails of the mean heap. And so here I'm going to run this for a moment, and I'm keeping count down here. You can't see it, but I'm tracking on 96.8% of our intervals so far have captured the true value. Two things to say about this. This is real randomness. OK, it's simulated in a computer, but it has all the properties of randomness. Trust me, a very good random number generator. Oh, look there, there are three almost in a row. That can't be random. Oh, dear. Sometimes I'll turn this on in the morning and play with it and think, I must have made a bug somewhere. You know, I've just got three in a row like this. And then you work out, well, it, it has to happen every seven days or so. So randomness in the short term locally is very lumpy, very surprising, very unpredictable. But if we run this for a few minutes, let alone overnight, the percentage here is going to um, even out and converge on 95.0 very, very closely. We're down to 95.6 at the moment. It'll fluctuate a bit. Not because there's any memory in this sequence, but because any early fluctuations are just sort of diluted out as we take many, many more. So there are two little things to note about randomness. In the short term, very lumpy and surprising. In the longer term, absolutely accurate. And it's those, that contrast, I guess, that keeps the world's casinos or helps keep the world's casinos in business. OK, let's, um, let me uh, uh, unclick here. I've got this little box here that you can't read that says, assume sigma known. We've been assuming that we know sigma, the population standard deviation, to calculate the length of all these intervals. Now, if I remove that assumption, some get longer, some get shorter. I'll do it again. That's assuming they're all the same length. Not assuming we know, some get longer, some get shorter, because every interval is calculated using the sample standard deviation. And yet, if I run it now, even though all these intervals are varying in length, we will level out at 95% in the long run. That's the beauty of the t-distribution and statistical theory that means these will be confidence intervals with the property that 95% of the infinite series will include the true value. Uh, just one more thing here. 95% intervals. Suppose I want 99. Do I make the intervals longer or shorter? Well, I want to be more confident of capturing mu, so I'd expect longer. Let's see. Yes, longer. There's 99, and they're all distinctly longer. If I go down to, say, 80% confidence intervals, they're much shorter, and many more are red, as you'd expect, because if we ran this, we'd get 20% red. So this is summarizing most of the things I talked about. I didn't talk about everything here, but this is standard textbook stuff 
about sampling and standard errors and confidence intervals. So I'm not pretending for a moment I've explained all that, but I hope you can see that um, ESC is a resource that allows you to explore these things, uh, teach it if you find that a good way to do things. So we have five interpretations of confidence intervals I'm going to put forward. The first is one from the dance, and this is the definitional one. And we say that our particular confidence interval here came from a dance, 95% of which included the true value. But ours might be red. We must never forget. Unfortunately, in the real life, confidence intervals don't come coloured. And in your lifetime of looking at a thousand or a million confidence intervals, 5% of them will be red. You'd have no idea which they are. The 10 you look at today might all be red or none red. You'll never know. So is it reasonable to interpret our single confidence interval? Well, I argue yes it is, provided that it's likely to be reasonably representative of the whole dance. And I can only think of really two situations where that's not true. One is when we've violated some of the assumptions. All this theory and discussion is based on random sampling and well done experiments and normal populations and so on. And if somebody had done three experiments and just given you the selected big one or the selected short confidence interval, well then that would have violated um, the randomness assumption and interpreting just that interval would be unjustified. Another is if you have an extremely small sample size of three or four or five, well then in fact the intervals uh, vary a lot in length and so the length of the interval is um, quite unreliable, quite uninformative. The second way is to interpret our interval. Interpret the middle, the two ends, the limits. We say values inside the interval are the most plausible for the true value. We think of the um, cat's eye picture uh, in our mind's eye on this confidence interval. The best bets are near the middle. And uh, perhaps you can advise me. What's that? A very big cat, you say. Well, that's true, yes. But you get a great view of the world through the cat's eye. It's very informative. It's very revealing, the cat's eye on a confidence interval. So I invite you to take away this image and impose it or superimpose it on any confidence interval uh, that you're working with, that you see. Oh, yes, there's a um, Gideon Pollyer cat. The third way, there's another whole discussion here, is to think of a confidence interval as a prediction interval for what would happen next time. And it turns out that on average there's about an 83% chance that the next mean, the mean of the next experiment, will fall within the 95% confidence interval. Why not 95% you ask? Well, there's error variability in uh, sampling variability in our first one and in our second one, combine it about an 83% chance. We've written a couple of papers about that. The fourth, we can think in terms of MOE and estimation and precision and focus on the, the poll with a MOE of 2%. So that 2% is an estimate of um, maximum likely error of estimation. That 2% is a measure of precision of our study. Large MOE, low precision. Small MOE, high precision. Do we like short intervals? We do. And I'll barely mention it, but we could translate to significance testing. If a null hypothesis is outside a 95% interval, that corresponds to two tail p of uh, less than 05. But this ignores much of the information the confidence intervals can provide and can, as we, I argued earlier, prompt incorrect interpretations. One thing the cat's eye can do is illustrate the relationship between level of confidence and length of a confidence interval. So here we have a 50% um, confidence interval, which is about one third as long as the 95%. And I've shaded in the area of the cat's eye spanned by this interval. So let's think of 95%. If we want to go to 99%, we have to span additional length until we've spanned 99% of the area in the cat's eye. And in fact, we've got to, because it's so thin up here, we've got to make it quite a bit longer to, to do that. In fact, about one third longer. 
And you can learn a few simple little benchmarks that will take you one minute of your life. Here's a 95% interval. If a null hypothesis value happens to fall right at the end of the interval, that's P05. A 99% interval is one third beyond out here. If a null hypothesis value is there, P01. Here's another way of um, thinking about this without invoking P values. The beautiful cat's eye picture tells you the distribution of plausibility. You can think of it the other way around and say, well, look, if you nominate any value along here, say 56, well, do our data give us any reason to doubt 56 as the true value? Well, yes. And the further away the value of interest is away from the confidence interval, the stronger the evidence against that value. That's sort of the inverse of saying a value out here is extremely implausible. And the reason I've shaded this in a gradual way, the reason the cat's eye just gradually thins out, is to highlight that we don't have um, big steps. We don't, we've got very gradual changes in both those things across distance. And in fact, with a little bit of practice, you can take any 95% confidence interval and you can read off the p-value, be a bit less than 05 there, very low here, or bypass p-values and just think about strength of evidence. Here you've got a bit of evidence against this value being the true one. Here you've got quite strong evidence. Here you've got very strong evidence. Here you've got no evidence at all. And in fact, you may well be ahead of me and eyeball the p-values like so. Here are the um, benchmarks, guidelines, approximate guidelines you can think about. One third of MOE beyond the limit of 95% gives you a 99%, so P is 01, and so on. Ah, yes, to see over the fence. So, I've mentioned five ways to interpret a confidence interval, and there they are. But I'm going to ask you a question. What's better than that? What's better than a two meter confidence interval? A. What's better than a two meter long confidence interval? You're right. <laughs> a one meter long confidence <laughs> interval. Absolutely. Well, perhaps it's this way. It's a big cat, but still, okay. That's excellent. Do we like short? We do. Small is beautiful, is the catch cry with confidence intervals. So choose any of these five, then interpret. And I'll just mention interpretation very briefly. The idea is that a confidence interval here represents a range of effect sizes that vary in plausibility given our data. Most plausible round about the center and then dropping off. So if we have our effect size scale here, like say change in anxiety score, we should um, or would be useful to mark reference points which may be clinically relevant or educationally important or large, whatever you like here. And I think it's part of the challenge of adopting estimation is that we develop our skills and our traditions of identifying these sort of benchmarks. Lots of research fields have these informally already. I say, oh, 10 milliseconds is hardly worth worrying about, but 20, now I'm getting interested. So we could label 10 and 20 here as reference points, and we could say here, well, with this result, most likely a medium effect, but it might be small, might even be almost large. The tragedy of the error bar. I'm very keen on pictures of confidence intervals, but alas, this lovely graphic, not the cat's eye, but this simple line graphic, has been adopted and used for lots of other things as well. People use them to show standard deviations, standard errors, 99, all sorts of things. That's extremely unfortunate. Every figure must state clearly, the publication manual says so, exactly what any error bars represent. The, um, perhaps the commonest, and a lot of psychology journals do this too, give us standard error bars. So we have a standard error either side of the mean. Maybe they're popular just because they're short, even though if we really understand, it's a bogus sort of shortening because they're just 
representing roughly the middle 68% of the cat's eye. The 95% confidence interval, in many cases, is about twice as long as the standard error bars. So if you see standard error bars in a graph, just double them mentally, and then you're back on home territory 95%. Well, what's wrong with standard error bars? The trouble is that standard deviations, that's a descriptive measure. It tells us about our data set. A 95% confidence interval is inferential. It gives us information about the underlying population, what we're trying to estimate. And just about always, that's what we want. What's a standard error? It's not really either sort of halfway or three quarters of the way towards inference. And this doubling rule doesn't work for very small samples and it doesn't work in lots of cases where we can calculate confidence intervals and standard errors are irrelevant like the confidence interval on a correlation for example. So my strong recommendation is use error bars for confidence intervals, represent confidence intervals as error bars with this graphic Avoid using standard error bars, and if ever you see standard error bars, be quite um, deliberate and immediate about doubling them to find the 95% interval. Here's an article that has been a bestseller. It's number three on all-time popularity in Mendeley, the big database of millions of papers. And it's just a, a simple little introductory thing saying, hey, standard deviation, standard error, confidence interval, N, variability and a few pictures, and if you can stand the biological sort of examples, then possibly you'll find it uh, of some use. It's a free download from that uh, link. So my conclusions from chapter three, section three, quite simple really. Do you like this figure? Did you think this was a bit long maybe? I usually have, I like to carry my portable one, particularly when I'm on the road. You probably can't see it from there, but that is even better. Oh, sorry, cat, like this, okay. And the other one, you can't see at all. Short is good. An effect size is the amount of anything of interest. The 95% confidence interval gives us inferential information, tells us about the underlying population, and that's the estimation we want. Think about your confidence interval in any of five ways, but always bear in mind it might be read. So we can think about cat size and graduated likelihood and plausibility and things, but you might have lucked out and it might be read. And then when you've got the effect size and the confidence interval, interpret. And that means you need to be subjective. You need to uh, take account of the research context and your research aims in explaining and giving your interpretation of what the centre of the interval is, the extent of MOE, the limits, whatever's appropriate to give meaning to your finding of an effect size and an interval. So that's the take home message from section three. And before we have a delicious sumptuous cup of coffee, We've got time for maybe three or four questions. Hi, Dr. Cumming. So I'm curious if you have any advice about how we might develop benchmarks for interpreting effect size, because even Cohen himself said it's very important to put it into context, and I fear that it could become the next, uh, it wouldn't be dichotomous, but the next critical cutoffs for truth, so to speak. Uh, really interesting point, and when I was writing this book, on lots of occasions, I came up against, well, I know the sort of thing I want to say, I want to interpret this in context, but I couldn't find any patterns to follow. And so I made some up. And uh, in the next section we'll come across a couple of examples. But this benchmarks for effect sizes is, is another example. Um, and I really scrabbled around and spoke to my colleagues, give me examples, I'm sure you've got them. So a hundred millimeter visual analog scale for pain. It turns out that at least some clinicians say, well, a 10 millimetre change on this 100 millimetre, that's what I think, roughly speaking, depending on context, is a clinically meaningful change. So unless I can get that, it's not worth much. Now, we can immediately pick holes in that, but at least a starting point. Um, lots of scales, um, say the Beck, 
will have score ranges and say, I don't know what they are, but you know, 10 to 15 is mild and 15 to 20 is severe and whatever. And so we can use those to assess the clinical relevance or the practical importance of a change of three or six or nine points. Uh, a neuropsychologist of mine said, oh, that's a tough one, Jeff. I know what you mean, but you know, nobody's written this stuff down. But look, actually, don't tell anyone, but um, when I'm doing um, neuropsych testing of memory, I reckon if I get a 15% change, then I take note of it. Less than that, well, maybe not. Um, your point that maybe if we do this, we're going to sort of re reify these particular things, that's a danger, and the point 2, point 5, point 8 of Cohen's um, benchmarks have gone that way, despite his exhortations that they should be just a last resort. And so we wouldn't want 10 millimeters on the VAS or whatever it is to be a new sort of standard for something that matters or not. It's really a, a guideline. Another relevant question is, well, okay, if we develop these sort of reference points for effect sizes, should it be just between you, me, and the three other people in the world who study this thing? Or should it be social psychology wide or intelligence wide? We probably need both. We probably need specialized ones and then more general ones. But the great thing about estimation is that all the relevant findings and numbers and confidence intervals are out there. So if you don't like 10 millimeters, you can come back and say, here are seven reasons why it should be five or why it should be 20, at least in these um, situations, and that's fine. And we should not shy away from subjectivity because everything in research is subjective. You decide on your issues, you decide on your measures, you choose your procedure, you choose a thousand other things. Why should we be so uh, worried that similarly making subjective judgments and putting forward uh, soundly based opinions is such a hassle, such a problem uh, when we're interpreting results. I think that should be um, uh, perfectly okay. I've talked too much. Perhaps we have one more question. That's because it was such a good question. Okay. A quick question, but a bad one, I'm afraid. What can we do with the fact that most of our sam a lot of our samples probably are self-selected? And given that they're self-selected, how can we be sure that randomness is, you know, that we follow that assumption? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the point is um, there are all sorts of criticisms that could be made of many uh, fields of psychology, many studies in many fields of psychology, and one of them is that we've relied too much on convenient samples and we haven't, usually college sophomores, and we haven't really taken seriously the issues of the underlying population and the randomness of sampling and uh, independence of data and things. And yet that's the literature out there. So when we want to come and do meta-analysis, well, are we going to accept that stuff? Are we just going to put it in? Surely we're mixing up good, bad, and of unknown quality. And that really is a real issue. And the whole research integrity thing, Ian Eady's argument, there are a lot of false positives out there, raise even more questions about what's there in the literature. And it is a real issue to know what we do. I mean, we probably have to use it, but we have to be, uh, we need more investigation about exactly um, how big and how bad a problem it is. And as may be obvious, I don't have, I don't think there is any uh, simple single answer. So after a break, we're going to go on to um, three more sections. Uh, the first one is um, some examples of using the new statistics. But meanwhile, for this central issue, this central section of confidence intervals, or cat's eyes, thank you for your attention. <laughs>